Hello, my name is Dr. Phyllis Z. I'm a professor of neurology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and director of the Sleep Disorder Center at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. Now let's examine the data presented in poster one. First, let's define circadian rhythms and discuss their roles in human physiology. Recall that most healthy organisms display predictable daily patterns in biochemical, physiologic, and behavioral processes. These circadian rhythms occur on a cycle of approximately 24 hours. In fact, the word circadian comes from the Latin for circa, which means about, and diem, which means day. If you look at figure one of the first display, you can see a representation of various circadian rhythms that occur with approximately one day periodicity. The most obvious circadian rhythm is the sleep-wake cycle, during which people usually go to bed at night and wake up in the morning at about the same time on most days. As you can see in this panel, a variety of other behavioral and physiologic events occur around the same time each day. Examples include the low point for core body temperature early in the morning and the start of melatonin production in the evening. Cardiovascular parameters, gastrointestinal function, and various measures of mood and performance also rhythmically change over the course of each day. To optimize these biologic systems, circadian rhythms must be synchronized or entrained relative to each other. Synchronization of circadian rhythms is controlled by a master pacemaker or biological clock in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN. In figure two of display one, you can see that the SCN is located in the anterior hypothalamus. The SCN in humans contains approximately 20,000 cells which send autonomic and neuroendocrine signals out to synchronize peripheral clocks in surrounding tissues, including other areas of the brain, heart, small intestine, pancreas, and liver. The SCN itself must also be properly synchronized to the surrounding environment to ensure that the output signals occur with circadian periodicity. Among the external cues that entrain the cells in the SCN, the most powerful is light. Other external signals, such as food intake, physical activity, and temperature also affect rhythms. During the day, as light enters the eye, specialized retinal cells are activated and transmit nerve signals via the retinal hypothalamic tract to the SCN. If we look at figure three of display one, we can see some examples of the clock-like precision of recurring circadian rhythms. For instance, rising and falling levels of insulin, leptin, and blood pressure can be predicted almost to the minute in healthy individuals. More complex physiological states and behaviors, such as mood and alertness, are also precisely regulated throughout the day. These and other circadian rhythms are integrally interconnected and the neurobiologic basis of these relationships are becoming increasingly clear. These scientific insights clearly have important implications for primary care clinicians who manage a variety of disorders in their patients. To restate, central and peripheral biologic clocks are reset daily by the SCN to ensure that physiologic processes and other systems are appropriately timed to events in the outside world. For example, as you would expect, the peak alerting signal usually occurs during the day and not at night when we are trying to sleep. Similarly, secretion of melatonin, a sleep-promoting compound, primarily occurs at night and not during the day when we are working. In some individuals, however, collapse of this tightly regulated network disturbs sleep and other important circadian rhythms. As presented in figure four of display one, Soon after waking, the circadian drive for alerting signal increases. This is shown by the dark blue curve in the graph. 
as the day progresses into the late afternoon and night, the alerting signal from the circadian drive peaks and begins to fall. Eventually, the circadian alerting signal falls to a level that allows the individual to fall asleep. The sleep-wake cycle is not governed solely by the circadian drive, however. Successive hours of wakefulness produce an increasing pressure to sleep called the homeostatic sleep drive, which is depicted by the purple curve. The homeostatic sleep drive and circadian drive interact throughout the day. The homeostatic drive increases the drive to sleep as the day progresses, whereas the circadian signal counteracts this process by promoting wakefulness. During the evening, the circadian alerting signal dissipates, making way for accumulating sleep pressure to promote sleep onset. However, sleep-wake schedules may be misaligned with internal or external signals, as shown by the example of a night nice shift worker in the bottom graph on figure four of display one. When the individual represented in this graph works at night, the homeostatic sleep drive continues to increase, resulting in additional sleep pressure. You can also see that the circadian alerting signal from the SCN reaches a nadir during the night shift, which together with the increased homeostatic sleep pressure will likely cause the individual to struggle to stay awake. On the other hand, the shift worker is trying to sleep at a time when the circadian alerting signal is still relatively high, which can lead to difficulty falling and more often staying asleep. Shift workers who experience the symptoms and associated functional impairment have a circadian rhythm disorder referred to as shift work disorder. The diagnostic criteria for shift work disorder are the presence of excessive sleepiness and or insomnia causing functional impairment for at least one month in association with a shift work schedule. High homeostatic sleep pressure and low circadian alerting signal during work can result in myriad adverse outcomes, including occupation-related accidents, impaired mood and emotional ability, the potential consequences should be specifically addressed and evaluated during the patient interview and physical examination. Now, please proceed to poster display two. The effects of circadian disruption on human health have recently received a significant amount of attention. Several studies have linked circadian misalignment with increased risk of developing certain diseases or worsening of existing pathologies. Many of the health-related consequences of circadian misalignment have been identified in shift workers. In particular, we are beginning to understand the adverse effects on cardiometabolic parameters. In figure one of display two, you can see some of the cardiometabolic abnormalities that have been found in shift workers, many of which are commonly observed in primary care patients. In fact, epidemiologic studies indicate that compared with the rest of the population, shift workers are more likely to develop metabolic syndrome, a cluster of risk factors for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. That includes central obesity, lower levels of high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, and elevated fasting glucose levels. The table in figure one comes from a study of 402 night shift nurses and 336 day working nurses who did not have symptoms of metabolic syndrome at the beginning of the study. As you can see, the incidence of visceral adiposity and low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, and high blood glucose levels was elevated in the night shift workers after four years compared with the day workers. Overall, the incidence of metabolic syndrome was 9% among night shift workers and only 1.8% among day workers at the four-year time point. Interestingly, various lifestyle-related risk factors for cardiometabolic disorders, including smoking and lack of exercise, are associated with shift work. It is not known, however, whether circadian disruptions make shift workers more likely to partake in these unhealthy behaviors, although this remains an active area of research. 
clearly, disruptive regulation of body weight and homeostasis can lead to obesity and increased risk of heart disease. Studies of leptin, a hormone that contributes to satiety or the feeling of being full after eating, have been performed in subjects with circadian disturbances. If you turn your attention to figure two of poster two, doctors June Nguyen and Kenneth Wright at the University of Colorado in Boulder maintained 14 healthy subjects on an artificial sleep-wake cycle known to misalign circadian rhythms. After 22 days, the investigators evaluated sleep and leptin levels. As shown in the table in panel two, sleep was more disrupted in the misaligned group. The latency to sleep onset, minutes in stage two sleep, and total sleep time were lower, whereas wakefulness after sleep onset was significantly higher. Average leptin levels were also significantly altered in the misaligned group. You can see in the line graph in figure two that leptin levels were reduced over 24-hour sleep-wake schedule at the end of the study compared with baseline levels. The investigators also compared average leptin levels during scheduled wakefulness and sleep. The bar graphs in figure two show that average leptin levels were significantly reduced by 10% in the misaligned group during wakefulness with no significant changes observed during sleep. This 10% decrease in leptin levels during scheduled wakefulness is nearly half of the 22% decrease found in other studies after three days of food restriction to about 70% of normal energy requirements. These caloric restrictions are a potent stimulus for increasing food intake. Therefore, the observed changes in leptin levels in response to circadian misalignment are physiologically meaningful. Decreased leptin levels may contribute to higher prevalence of obesity in misaligned shift workers because leptin-induced satiety signals are reduced in this population, resulting in increased caloric intake and weight gain. Although this study does not address the effects of chronic circadian misalignment experienced by many shift workers, it does support the adverse hormonal and cardiometabolic effects of shift work in a subset of individuals. Future research will certainly need to address the potential for alterations in other endocrine systems and to identify individual differences in the ability to realign circadian rhythms. In conclusion, we are now beginning to understand the relationships among impaired sleep, circadian misalignment as observed in circadian rhythm disorders, and numerous other chronic conditions, including cardiometabolic disorders. And while the pathophysiologic basis of circadian rhythm disorders remain only partly understood, clinical assessment and management of these conditions is relatively straightforward. Most importantly, clinicians should obtain good sleep histories from all of their patients and dig deeper into self-reported difficulties, falling asleep at bedtime or staying awake while driving, working, or performing other important social activities. Thank you for joining me in this section of the program. We're going to talk about circadian rhythm disorders. Hopefully you know what circadian rhythm disorders means by now because of some of the prefacing talks that you've seen, right? So folks, here's the story. That's my name, and that's Dogramji, and if you, if you uh, guess my ethnicity, you get a free dinner. <laughs> no, 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 don't yell it out, that's not fair. <laughs> and and uh, as a family physician for about 26 years or so, uh, there I was about 15 years ago. My older brother, he's a sleep specialist. He comes to me and he says, you family doctors, you really don't know anything about sleep. And he was right because we're not taught anything like that in, in our training. I mean, very few of you, I, I, I imagine, got any kind of real good education in sleep. All that you maybe knew about sleep was it, it's something that gets in the way of being on call or get drowsiness is something we don't want. Maybe it's like a study hall or whatever it is. All that we know is that if we don't sleep well, we don't feel good. Right? But what I came to understand with my discussions with him, and after that we did some research together, we've done writing together, lecturing, we even wrote a book together uh, on, on sleep, 
specifically geared to primary care providers. And what I've learned from that is there's an awful lot that we don't know, that we need to know, so that we can help our patients with certain symptoms that we never dreamed could be from sleep disorders, like tiredness, for example, okay? So what, we, what I've been able to find out and what I want to impart to you is, is this. First of all, it's very important for sleep quantity to be there, okay? Sleep quantity. You have to have your daily allowance of sleep, very similar to food, very analogous to food. You have to have the right quantity of sleep, very important. And if you don't sleep long enough, bad things do happen. Cumulatively, not only do you not feel well the next day, but there's a lot of morbidity and even decreased life expectancy attached to people that don't sleep long enough, okay? We also know that sleep quality is very important, okay? It's not just important to sleep eight hours. One sleep quality problem, which is obstructive sleep apnea, people stop breathing in their sleep. Tremendous amount of morbidity and increased mortality just by poor quality sleep. But today, we're not going to talk about the duration of sleep that's important or the quality of sleep. We're going to talk about the timing of sleep. It turns out that it's not just important to sleep long enough and good quality, but you also have to do it at the right time. Again, very analogous to food, we know that you have to have the right amount of food, the right quality of food, but it's, uh, there's also timing involved. We don't graze throughout the day. We eat at regular intervals. We eat breakfast, lunch, and supper. Then we don't eat again. We don't wake up in the middle of the night and eat. We know the timing of food is important. Timing of sleep is important. That's what we're going to talk about tonight in the next couple of minutes. First, before I go on to the didactic part, I am going to do something really interesting. I'm going to bring up a patient, a live patient, who has some problems. Let's see what happens with this interview. John, are you here? There's our sick guy. Come on up. Have a seat right there. Oh, by the way, as John is walking up, make sure you take out your earbuds, right, so you can hear me? Okay, take those out and silence your cell phones. If I hear any cell phones going off, you don't get dinner. <laughs> All right. John, how are you feeling? Not so good, Doc. Not so good? You've come to the right place. What's yeah. going on? What brings you here to see me today? Well, actually, I, uh, I have to come to you because I have to get clearance to get back to work. Um, you know, I drive a truck. You're, yeah, you drive a truck. I know that. And... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had an accident. Uh oh. And uh, it was right towards the end of my shift. And, uh, you know, for insurance purposes, I got to get uh, checked out, make sure there's nothing physically wrong with me. Are you injured? Did something happen to you? No, I, fortunately, no. It was just myself and the truck and the guardrail. Well, but, uh, tell me more details about the accident. Uh, what happened exactly? As I said, it was towards the end of my shift. What do you mean by um, shift? Uh, well, about 6 30 in the morning. Oh, so you do night shift? Yeah, I switched to night shifts about two years ago. Okay. All right, and, uh, so what is actually your shift from when to when? Midnight to 8. Okay, and this happened at what time? About 6.30. At the, towards the end of your shift. Okay, all right, keep going. And uh, I suppose I dozed off, uh, um, but it couldn't have been for very long because I know where I was on the road, uh -huh. and I know when I, I think it was more the reaction to falling asleep uh -huh. that caused me to... To jerk about. Well, it actually jerked. So you were driving, and the next thing you know, you were, hit, you were hitting something? Is that, is yes. that what you... Okay. All righty. Right and the, and the truck jackknifed, you said? Yeah. Okay. Did you hit anybody else? No. No other vehicles involved. Just myself. Okay. And the, uh, and the guardrail. And, and work needs to know that there isn't something wrong with you that caused you to maybe uh, have a lapse of consciousness or something like that. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I'd like to know, too. I mean, okay. I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a good truck driver. Yeah. Uh, and two years ago, I made a decision to do night work because it pays a whole lot better. Okay. And, uh, you know, I've got kids, you know, college is looming in the future. All right, I see. Now, you said that, you know, you, you may have had a lapse of consciousness here. Have you noticed that kind of stuff to happen since you took on this, this graveyard shift? Yes, I have. Actually, it's really not, I've never adjusted to it. It's really? just something I've sort of tried to manage as I could, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not a night person okay. by nature, I oh. guess. All right, that's important and to know. So, you, so tell me about your energy level. Are you tired throughout your waking hours? Are you yeah, tired when you're driving? Well, early on, I could, I could sort of catch up on the weekend when I would live a normal life, but I, I, I just noticed it's, 
I can never get ahead of the tiredness. So it's like I'm always tired. I see. Okay. Well, let me understand a little bit more about things. Um, so you, your shift ends at around 8 o'clock in the morning, you 8 said? 8 o'clock in the morning. What happens then? Do you come home, home right away? I just go right home. You okay. know, usually I can get home by 9, mm -hmm. 9.30 at the latest with traffic, get something to eat, uh -huh. read the paper, watch some TV. Is your family home when you get there usually? Uh, sometimes I catch the tail end of them before they're off to school. But Okay. And then what? Uh, and then I try to get my, you know, my night's sleep, which would anywhere between four to five and a half hours. Okay, and what but times are those? What time do you get into bed? What time do you think you fall asleep? Well, 10, usually about 10 a.m. But if I'm, you know, if I'm you know, home in good time, I can speed it up a bit. But it's generally 10 o'clock till about three is the latest mm -hmm. I've ever slept. Do you ever struggle to fall asleep? Oh yeah, okay. m many times. And do it's you wake up? It's hard to fall asleep. I'm sorry? It's hard to fall asleep with the sun out and the, you know, the activities in the neighborhood. And okay. And wh what about uh, while you're sleeping? Does anything disturb you while you're sleeping? Uh, well, sometimes it's not consistent. But the, uh, the phone, I mean, sometimes I can sleep right through a phone ringing, mm -hmm. but sometimes the phone wakes me up and then I can't get back to mm -hmm. sleep. So you'll get anywhere from four to five and a half hours of sleep. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And folks, again, what we said earlier is the right amount of sleep for most people in average the average amount of sleep for adults is about eight and a quarter for them to feel well and do well. He's only getting about four to five hours of sleep. Quantity of sleep is a problem here. Let's go on. So then you wake up in the afternoon and your family comes and you do your family stuff, your daddy right. stuff. Okay. Yeah. Then what happens? Uh, then usually about seven o'clock I start to gear up towards getting out, get okay. things together, get the truck, get to wherever it is that I'm doing the pickup. And okay. then... Uh, I generally got to get the truck there by 11, and then midnight I start driving. Okay. And when you drive, do you, uh, you said you feel tired. Do you do anything to be more alert, anything at all? Uh, I drink a lot of coffee. Okay. All righty. <laughs> I guess in a cab when you have to pee, there's... Well, what do you, well, no, well, don't answer that. Yeah. You don't want to go there. <laughs> but, yeah. All right. So now I understand that you're tired throughout, and you're not getting that much sleep. And I understand that, that you may have even some lapse of consciousness when you're driving, which is obviously very dangerous, and you've put yourself in a, in a, in a bad situation. Has it also affected your mood? Do you feel irritable, cranky, that sort of stuff? You got a problem with that? Well, <laughs> I guess no. you do. I mean, no, no, I, well, I guess, yeah, I could, I, you know, if, I guess if you ask my wife and kids, maybe they'd say lately it's probably gotten a little worse than it's ever been. Okay, I, honestly, you know, John, you do seem a little bit more irritable, just, I mean, just from me knowing you. Uh, I don't mean anything bad by that, but you know the, the the tiredness can also affect your mood. It can affect your you know your 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 temperament, and it seems like it mm. is. Am I right? Well, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Has it affected your appetite? Because I mean, you've gained some weight since I saw you last. No, time. thankfully, that's not not m a problem I have. Well, you uh, gained weight though. I mean, you you really <laughs> have, and your blood pressure is up a little bit since since you I saw you. Say the nicest things. Well, doc. I'm telling you like it is. You know, I mean, that's what's been happening, and and you know, it's not unusual. I'm just trying to point out to you that what I think is wrong with you is a condition known as shift work disorder, okay? People who do shift work, there's a tendency for them to, to be dissynchronized. You're completely out of sorts and out of sync. So not only do you have tiredness, but it affects you physically. It can make your blood pressure go up. It can make your weight go up. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Mm. Now, let me ask you something. You said that you switched to this about two years ago or so. Can you switch? Can you get out of your shift work? Can you go back to your daytime normal shift? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's nobody's holding a gun to my head, but no, for my own personal choice, no, I, I've got to do this for a few more years, and okay. that's why I want to manage it okay. as best I can. Well, if that's the case, then, I'm going to give you some advice right now to see if we can have you synchronize a little bit better. Here's the advice that I want to tell you. First of all, what I'd like for you to do is, uh, is ma try to maximize that sleep when you come home. How do you do that? Well, the first thing we want to do is have you put sunglasses on on your drive home from work to home. I don't want that light to get in your eyes to try to trick your brain into thinking it's time to be awake. Light makes you al awake. Light makes you alert. We want that to go away. So, first thing is sunglasses on your way home. When you get home, I don't want you to do things that are arousing and activating. No running around, streaming, eating, reading the paper, TV, this and that, whatever. I want you and your family to know when you get home, it should be quiet and you should be gearing yourself for sleep. So, and also, I want your wife to make sure that the shades that you have completely block off all sunlight. I want it to be really dark. I want you to get into bed as, 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 uh, within one hour or so of getting home. A light meal, not a large meal. 
okay? And that's a very important thing. So let's say instead of getting to bed at 10 o'clock or so, I want you to be in bed more like 9 o'clock. And I want you to try to stay in bed as long as you can as far as sleep goes, maybe as long as 3 o'clock, so that instead of 4 or 5 hours sleep, we're getting 6. So quantity of sleep with quality of sleep is something I really need you to do. So get up at around 3 o'clock, that's fine with me. But let me also suggest another thing. Right before you go to work, I'd like you to get a little nap. That nap is very critical to increase in increase or improve your alertness. So let's say you have to be at work at, at 12 o'clock or so, you leave for work at 11, try to take a nap between 9 and 10. About an hour, maybe even an hour and a half, not many longer than that. If you drag it on too much, then you're going to have sleep inertia. You'll be too drowsy for work. Your brain won't wake up. And these are the kind of things that I want you to do. Caffeine, coffee, not a bad idea. Let me give you some advice on that. About a quarter to a third of a cup every hour but I want you to stop about two or three hours prior to your shift so that there's no caffeine in you when you're going to try to sleep for your anchor sleep in the morning. These are some of the things that I want you to do. Last but not least, I want you to try this out for about a month or so. You may also want to pick up some melatonin. Melatonin is a pretty good chemical that you can take, a nice supplemental medicine. Well, I don't like to call it a medicine, but it's a nice supplement you can take when you get home and, and take that between three to five milligrams to help you readjust your brain clock. These are all the things that I want you to do and really try to do them because they've been proven to be effective, all these different things, so that they can improve your alertness, improve the way you feel throughout your waking hours, and hopefully not have you nod off like you've been. Mm. These are the kind of things. If these don't work, I want you to come back in one month. If they don't work, we may even need to talk about prescription medication, okay? Mm. But for now, try what I said and let's see how things go, all right? Okay, John, we'll talk to you in about a month or so. All right, guys. The very important thing that, that we talked about with John is this. The tiredness which you had, the lapses of consciousness which you had, was one of the symptoms of a misalignment. And that's what's going on with, with the circadian rhythm, is there needs to be alignment. Why? Well, the, the cardiovascular, endocrine, GI, musculoskeletal, nervous system, these all work in a 24-hour clock. They don't work the same throughout a 24-hour clock. They have rhythms. They have biorhythms. You saw that out there. Okay, so if you try to be awake when your brain and body and everything are in a sleep mode, or when you try to be asleep when your brain and body are in awake mode, this dyssynchrony can cause problems. We need to know that different things happen in different times of the day. We need to respect that, and synchrony is such an important thing. Regular periodicity in various systems is very important that you know this concept. And this, this kind of a circadian rhythm synchrony is so important. It starts with the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN. As a reminder, this is a group of around 20,000 neurons on either side uh, of, or, or right above the optic uh, chiasm. That's why it's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And what it is, is the master brain clock. It tells the brain, brain when to wake up, and it tells the rest of the body how to be synchronized, okay, towards a 24-hour clock. Now, this suprachiasmatic nucleus, then, it entrains itself, it entrains the rest of the body by two very important signals. One of the signals is light. When light goes through the retinohypothalamic tract into the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN says, oh, it's sunlight. We need to be awake. Let's synchronize to our wakefulness. Then on the other side, there's melatonin that comes from the pineal gland. When, when melatonin comes to the SCN, the SCN says, oh, wow, it's dark. Let's go into a darkness or sleep mode. So two very important signals that we need to respect, and we can use them for our favor. For him, what I suggested is he takes some melatonin to re-entrain the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And I also asked him to shade himself from light so that light won't tell the SCN to, to be awake on his drive home. Now, another thing that I may have wanted to tell him is to actually use light in his workplace to keep him alert, but I can't do that. What I'm going to do, have a bright light in his, in his uh, cap? We can't do that. So it's very important that you understand that there are these, the, the suprachiasmatic nucleus which entrains the peripheral clock that, are all, that are, are all throughout these different organ systems. Because if they're not entrained, bad things happen. Dyssynchrony can cause a lot of morbidity. You saw that out there. We know that it increases the probability of cardiovascular disease and blood pressure elevation. For John, his blood pressure is going up just because of dyssynchrony. We know that there is problems with insulin resistance and weight gain, as we've seen in John. Okay, so again, dyssynchrony causing problems there. In the GI tract, there's a higher rate of, of irritable bowel syndrome and peptic ulcer disease in those who have shift work disorder. 
But here's another thing that's very sobering, cancer. We know that there's a, at least one study which shows in nurses, for example, that work more than four or five years doing night shift, there's a higher probability of breast cancer. And men are not uh, excluded from this. Men develop prostate cancer. There's a Japanese study which shows this. So if folks, it turns out that not only is it important to sleep long enough and is good quality, but the timing seems to be such a critical aspect for us to have good health, dyssynchrony and morbidity. Now, there's a couple of other circadian type disorders. Now we've talked about shift work disorder here, but there's also another one which is called advanced sleep phase. This is where the sleep phase is advanced such that patients or people get drowsy too early in the evening at around seven o'clock at night and they wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Those are generally senior citizens, and there's reasons why things happen. There's also delayed sleep phase. These are people that, for whatever reason, can't get to sleep until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. You may be familiar with these type of people. They don't fall asleep till 1 or 2, playing their video games or talking to, to online or whatever, and then at 6 or 7, they need to get up and go to school, and you need to put your foot in their butt to get them out the door. But they're saying, I'm tired all the time. We call those beautiful people teenagers, right? So delayed sleep phase disorder. So there are various types of dyssynchrony that can happen. It can cause problems not just with alertness and mentation, but again, morbidity in so many uh, various organ systems. Folks, it's really important to understand this two-process model of sleep for us to go on to the next uh, phase of what we need to, to, to discuss. When you wake up in the morning at around 7 o'clock, everybody should be normally wide awake. But as every minute goes by, guess what happens? You get more and more drowsy. You get drowsier and drowsier. You are accruing, or you're increasing rather, what's called a homeostatic sleep drive. You are accruing sleep hunger, okay? What's going on is you are actually accumulating extracellular adenosine in your brain, which causes drowsiness. Every minute you're awake then, you're getting drowsier and drowsier. So I know what you're thinking right now, and you're asking, well, I'm not drowsy right now. What do you mean? I've been awake for about 10, 12 hours. I may yawn a little bit, but I'm not that drowsy. Why am I not drowsy? Because of this, the circadian drive put out by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It starts with a low-level circadian drive in the beginning of the day. But as every minute goes by, it amplifies its circadian drive. Its alerting signal is amplified to counteract the amount of sleep homeostatic sleep drive, such that the resultant alertness is, is about the same throughout the day, which is good, okay? So at around 11 o'clock at night, for most people, their homeostatic sleep drive is really at a maximum level, but so is their circadian drive. So their homeostatic sleep drive is, is up here, and their circadian drive is up here, they're alert. But guess what happens then? Your master sleep clock, your, your SCN then, plummets in its alerting activity. And what happens as a result? You have an overwhelming amount of homeostatic sleep drive, and you get very drowsy, and you have to sleep. And you do go to sleep, and you pay back your sleep debt by getting rid of all that extracellular adenosine throughout the night because you're asleep. And about, about 7 o'clock in the morning, you've paid back all your sleep debt, everything goes back to normal again, and you can wake up. Unless you do what John does. What does he do? At around 11 o'clock or so, what is he doing? Instead of going to sleep, he's actually getting on more additional sleep pressure. He's staying awake. He's getting more and more homeostatic sleep drive, while at the same time, his circadian drive is plummeting. A tremendous amount of drowsiness to the extent that he's tired all the time, and he then zones out and actually nods off and gets into an accident. Shift work disorder then is one of the biggest problems that's going on, and a nice way of understanding what's happening to him with this two process model. Okay, that's the bad news. The good news is you can do stuff about it. You can re-entrain things. I give them a lot of advice on what to do. You can re-entrain your brain clock. You can retrain your suprachiasmatic nucleus. Not in everybody. There are some people that are hot-wired, and, and there's a, there are phenotypes of this. Certain people, you, you know, they do better with re-entraining. Others can't. I don't know how John will do. We'll see him in about a month or so to see how well he does. But people that you can re-entrain, here's what can happen. This is a study done in a sleep laboratory where patients uh, uh, were, were given a, a situation to have them get shift work disorder. Basically, we had them stay up all night and do stuff, okay? And, and one group of people, we didn't re-entrain them. We didn't do anything to them. Another group, though, we, there was some intervention where we partially re-entrained them. We did certain things to help them along, to help them adjust. And then another group, we really helped them to get re-entrained. And look what happened when it came to parameters of mood, mental fatigue, 
and performance. Those that were re-entrained, they did much better with mood, mental fatigue and performance. Even if they were partially re-entrained, they did pretty good. Those, of course, that were not entrained, mood, mental fatigue and performance got worse and worse throughout the night. So if you help people with their circadian rhythm disorders, with their shift work disorder, as with John, you can actually make a difference. The suggestions I gave him should make a difference. So what are the things that you can do? What are the ways that you can ascertain what's going on? Folks, I really need you to know this. When somebody comes to your office who says they're tired all the time, you need to get a sleep history. You need to get one. Not just, don't just look for depression and anemia, thyroid deficiency, that sort of stuff. Look for the possibility that they have a sleep problem. Patients who are tired, there's a high tendency for them to actually be complaining of a sleep problem. Get a sleep history. It took me only a couple of minutes to do so. There's a couple of other things that we can do, and let's go over them as well. A sleep history is really simple. I mean, what did I ask John? When do you go to bed? How long does it take for you to fall asleep? How long do you sleep? How well do you sleep? How do you feel throughout the day? Do you take naps? And what's it like on weekends? The whole thing takes about a minute, minute and a half. And my whole interview with John was about five minutes, and I could tell that he had shift work disorder just by getting a sleep history. You need to ask your patients who are tired about a sleep history. The next thing that you may want to do for them is this, is, is if you can't get enough of a history, is a sleep log. John, I don't know exactly what's going on with you. You don't either. Go home, keep a sleep log, and come back. If you're not sure how to do it, go to sleepclinician.com. They have sleep logs that you can actually download and print out and give to patients. Basically, you ask them to, to keep a log, like they do with, let's say, their diet or migraines, etc. Just keep a log of when they go to bed, when they wake up, and things in between. A sleep log, then, can be somewhat helpful. But another thing that's really cool for you to know about, not necessarily do on every patient, but you need to know the concept behind this, is something called an Epworth sleepiness scale. Folks, when people are tired, it's important to know if they have a sleep problem. And one of the ways of understanding it is by doing an Epworth sleepiness scale on them. What this does is it quantifies how drowsy somebody is. It quantifies how, how drowsy it is. Actually even tells you if their tiredness is actually a drowsy problem, a sleep problem. What you do is you ask them, in these normal life situations, what is the chance of you dozing off from zero to one to two to three? And they give a number here, and if the number adds up to 10 or more, that's considered abnormal tiredness of the sleepiness variety. Abnormal sleepiness. There's a problem with sleep that you got to fix. So patients coming in with tiredness, you may want to do this so that you can identify if they have a sleep problem. Patients with shift work disorder have epworth sleepiness scales of 14, 15, 16. Sleep apnea is about 15 or 16. Narcolepsy is around 19 or so. A nice way to quantify or even just figure out whether somebody's tiredness is actually from sleepiness. Okay, so what are the things that we can do? What are the th interventional methods? I already went through them with John. I'm not going to repeat many of them, but I want to highlight this. Get enough sleep. I wanted John to make sure he got at least a six hours of anchor sleep, regular sleep at the same time. Good sleep length and good quality, and also even naps. Naps are not a bad idea. Okay, I asked him to take a bit of a nap just to pay back a lot of his sleep debt. There's all these other things that we know, but the whole thing adds up to this. Keep the time before you go to sleep sacred, make sure it's sleep friendly, and then keep your sleep time regular and long and good quality. Discontinue caffeine four to six hours before bedtime. What did I ask him to do about caffeine? I asked him not to drink for two or three hours prior to ending his shift. Okay, smoking, he does smoke, we need to do something about that, put that on the back burner, but again, we want to get good noise-free and, and, and uh, light-free uh, sleep. But there's also stuff that we can do, not to the sleep part, but also to the alerting part. What are the things that we can do to optimize alertness? What can I do to help him while he's driving be as alert as possible? Well, again, adequate sleep time, especially that nap that we talked about, but also, uh, uh, other than that, appropriately timed light. The only thing I can do for him is actually the anti-light, which is, which is darkness. See if I can have him use sunglasses on the way home. But with many other occupations, you can use light in your favor. Nurses, ER doctors, policemen, uh, those that work in AMPM markets, etc. Maximize light. Make it as brightly lit as possible. Get as much light to go in to tell your SCN, okay, all right, we are in a, we're trying to synchronize towards light being out, not synchronize towards darkness and sleep coming around.
Finally, when all else fails, you can go to medication. Or maybe in, in certain situations, you want to use it early on. I heard to talk to you about melatonin, but you could even use hypnotics. There are some people that just can't get to sleep. What if he comes back and he says to me, I still can't sleep. I'm only getting four or five hours of sleep. We may want to use it. The funny thing, though, is that it turns out, and this kind of is irritating, if you help them sleep, sometimes it doesn't actually improve alertness. And that's why we want to use caffeine. Caffeine is a very good thing. Or even, look at this, there's a medication, there are two medications indicated for the drowsiness of shift work disorder. And that's modafinil and armodafinil. And these are medicines that you administer one hour prior to starting the shift, and it works throughout the entire shift to enhance alertness. Look, folks, you try to do the best you can with your patients, and when things don't work out well, again, there are medications that you want to use. Um, I think our time is up at this point. Uh, let me just make sure about my last slide. Yes. Conclusions. Circadian rhythm misalignment is associated with serious medical and psychiatric consequences, such as shift work disorder, mood impairment, and cardiometabolic disease. Excessive sleepiness or tiredness and insomnia are good surrogate markers for, for circadian rhythm disorders, looking at somebody's sleep habits. Circadian rhythm disorders can often be diagnosed using an initial and longitudinal sleep history. All you got to do is ask about sleep. When somebody's tired, ask them about their sleep. Do an EPRO sleepiness scale. And pharmacologic and or non-pharmacologic approaches, a lot of lifestyle changes can align circadian rhythms and reduce symptoms in patients with circadian rhythm disorders. 